Today, I wish to start a new discussion on a significant topic. This session is likely just the beginning, and we may need to extend this discussion over multiple sessions. I'd like to explain why I'm bringing up this topic. My goal isn't to draw out opinions, but rather as a student, I truly want to grasp the problem. I hope to encourage our listeners to explore and understand the underlying causes of this issue more deeply. I hope they come to appreciate the various viewpoints, the religious, historical, and political dimensions that underpin this issue and gain a thorough understanding of these aspects before forming their own opinion. And it's your unique strength to guide people in understanding sensitive and contentious issues, helping them grasp the problem first before you share your own perspective. The Palestinian issue has been ongoing for a long time, sparking numerous religious and intellectual movements. After presenting the perspective of the average Muslim, I'll come directly to you for your thoughts. We all know how important Makkah and Medina are to Muslims. That's where God's prophet was chosen and where our sacred sites are located. We feel a unique connection to these places and God has laid down specific guidelines for them. We're certain about their sanctity, but then what about Palestine? What about the holy sanctuary in Jerusalem, Bayatul Muqaddis? And what's the significance of this first Qibla? We hold beliefs that earlier prophets were appointed in this place, which was our first Qibla. Then came the Crusades, followed by Jewish occupation. Now there's a prevailing sentiment among us about the need to free our sacred sites from their control and occupation. The key question I'm asking is, as a Muslim, what importance does the land of Palestine hold for me? How am I connected to it? And what does my faith tell me about it? First off, it's essential to grasp how Jerusalem and Palestine became intertwined with the religion. I've explained numerous times that the divine plan of prophethood initiated by God unfolded in two stages. The initial stage is what God refers to when he says, I have sent a messenger to every community. Obviously, during that era, there were also significantly fewer nations in existence. As these nations began to spread across the world, God declared that a messenger had been sent to every one of these nations. His law is that for every nation, there is a messenger. Then when their messenger comes, their fate is justly decided and no injustice is done to them. Thus, for every community to which a messenger was sent, a judgment was established, and for these communities, a fair verdict was decided in this world itself. This is a divine practice. The Quran states that the court for individuals will be established on judgment day, but for nations, their court is in this world itself. In ordinary situations, beyond this divine plan of prophethood, nations that emerge on the world stage also go through phases of infancy, adolescence, and youth. Eventually, upon reaching their old age, they decline and perish. God provides different nations with opportunities on the world stage in turn. This is also established as a principle, tilkalayamun udaviluha bayna nas, which means we cycle these changes of fortune among people as a test. In other words, nations take their turn, one after the other, appearing on the global scene. In the nations where messengers were appointed, as I've mentioned, their judgment is established in this world. That is, the same kind of court that will be set up for individuals on Judgment Day is set up for these nations right here in this world. Their verdicts were delivered, and the Quran references these outcomes on various occasions. This includes the outcomes for the people of Ad, Thamud, the community of Shuaib, the people of Lot, and the followers of Prophet Abraham, peace upon them all. This represents the first phase of God's divine plan of prophethood. After this, the second phase of prophethood commences. It's clear that when nations were dispersed in various places and people lived nomadic lifestyles, the circumstances were different. But over time, the world began to settle more. Tribes and nations started forming, and eventually, they evolved into larger states. As this stage was unfolding, Prophet Abraham was appointed with the declaration that he was chosen for the guidance and leadership of the world. 
inni jailuka lil nasi imama meaning i have decided to appoint you the leader of mankind signifies his role as a leader for the people so what did this leadership entail clearly it was about providing guidance or leadership in matters of religion or deen with his appointment came the extra responsibility to ensure that part of his descendants settled in Canaan while another group made their home in the Arabian Peninsula thus after presenting god's message to his community and once his argument was conclusively made he departed from that place following his migration divine punishment descended upon his community as it has been detailed in surah tauba after arriving in this region he built the place of worship we refer to as the house of god or masjid e haram every muslim knows about its history it was rebuilt its ancient foundations restored the exact details of its early history are hard to pinpoint when it first began and the various stages it went through nonetheless it was reconstructed once the foundations were reestablished and the house was completed the masjid stood ready god instructed prophet abraham to devote his son to the task of caring for and safeguarding this sacred place the responsibility of its custodianship would continue within their family furthermore the quran has informed us that a significant change in the prophetic system occurred previously individual prophets like prophet abraham or those before him were appointed however it was then decreed that prophethood would be specific to the descendants of prophet abraham instead of sending prophets for every community this decision was made around 4000 years ago to reserve prophethood for the nation of prophet abraham it would now be confined to his descendants both messengers and prophets will be chosen from his descendants additionally another decision was made these descendants would be entrusted with the responsibility of bearing witness to the truth of god and testifying about him in this world this means that the appointment or selection would not be limited to individuals rather the entire nation would be chosen for this purpose their selection was the very reason they were liberated from the bondage of pharaoh prophet moses was appointed and through his leadership he delivered them from egypt this choice and the fulfillment of its requirements were the driving forces behind this liberation this is mentioned in the quran in surah al imran indeed allah chose adam and noah and the family of abraham and the family of imran over the worlds inna allah astafa adam wa nuhan wa ala ibrahim wa ala imran ala al alamin we have chosen individuals like adam and noah as prophets following that we selected the entire nation of abraham and later the family of imran is specifically mentioned in reference to prophet jesus the selection of the entire nation and its descendants meant that the nation couldn't go into another nation to invite them to their religion they needed their own territory so a decision was made that initially one branch would be given this opportunity the children of israel who are they in other words the lineage goes as follows the son of prophet abraham is isaac whose son is jacob and jacob's son is joseph so the name israel is an appellation of prophet jacob he is known by this name in other words it's the appellation for the grandson of prophet abraham the grandson of prophet abraham as it gained more recognition hence they identify themselves as the children of israel in the quran we observe that god addresses them by the title of children of israel therefore the chosen people were all the descendants of abraham this implies that the entire lineage of prophet abraham had been selected However, after these two branches, a decision wasn't made for the third son. He settled separately. Concerning the first two, it was determined that the descendants of Isaac would settle in Canaan, the ancient name for Palestine. On the other hand, the decision for the nation in which our prophet was born, through the elder son Ishmael and his descendants, the Bani Ishmael, was to establish themselves in the Arabian Peninsula. Furthermore, it becomes evident that these two regions had been designated by god for his own purpose 
although the entirety of the land belongs to God and indeed the entire universe is his domain. However, on earth, God has set apart these two regions as special for his divine plan. In religious terminology, this is referred to as takdiz, meaning the act of making something holy. It's known as al-arzul mukadisa, signifying the land chosen by God for himself. Hence, God has designated this land for his deen, his dawah, the call to faith, and for conveying his message. Therefore, it is the act of takdiz, or sanctification, bestowed upon that land. It is akin to when an individual purchases a piece of land and decides to build a mosque on it. Similarly, Christians may decide to construct a church on their land. This concept applies to other nations as well. Hence, according to the beliefs of each community, that land becomes designated for the worship of the Lord. One scenario is choosing a piece of land for a mosque. However, in this case, the responsibility extends to an entire nation, entrusting them with this sacred duty. Therefore, an entire region has been chosen, where Prophet Ishmael settled. He established his residence there and served as the messenger of God. This marked the culmination of the argument among the local populace, including Bani Jurham, who are mentioned in historical records. Subsequently, the people embraced faith in him, leading to the commencement of the nation of Bani Ishmael. They were granted the guardianship of the house of God and entrusted with the duty of safeguarding this sacred place. They will ensure its purity from all forms of polytheism, shirk, and this land of Arabia will continue to be their homeland. On the other hand, the children of Israel received instructions to depart from Egypt. This call to embark on their journey is not aimed at securing their nation's freedom. Instead, it is a commitment to fulfill a responsibility that was decided upon following the appointment of Prophet Moses. The goal is to establish the center of monotheism, Tawheed, in Palestine. First, they were given the opportunity. They were the initial selection, as mentioned in various verses of the Quran, which translates to, among all the nations of the world, I have chosen them. What you encounter right after its introduction in Surah Baqarah is the recurring theme that you, from among the nations of the world, have been chosen and favored. But what does this preference entail? Essentially, it signifies the devotion to a significant responsibility. Just as the appointment of a messenger embodies God's preference, so does the selection of an entire nation or race. It is a profound virtue bestowed upon them, for God has singled them out from among all the nations of the world for his purpose. In this regard, if you were to read the Bible, you would discover that, much like the Quran, it serves as a chronicle and record of the journey and prophetic mission of the Messenger of God, Muhammad peace be upon him. Similarly, the Bible is a documentation of their prophetic missions. It encompasses the manifestation of divine recompense that is destined to occur through them, the responsibility entrusted to them, and the significant role they have been designated to fulfill. It provides a comprehensive account of these aspects, how it commenced, and the various stages they underwent. Clearly, these individuals were required to enter Palestine. They received the command to engage in jihad as there were other nations present in that region. The divine law dictates that whenever there is a substantial number or a large group of people with the messenger, it has been ordained that this responsibility of jihad is placed upon them. God has elucidated in the Quran the specific circumstances in which he entrusts this responsibility to his people. Otherwise, God carries out his work through his angels intervening as he pleases. However, when he delegates a responsibility to his servants, to us human beings, he has affirmed that there exists a minimum threshold and I evaluate your capabilities before assigning any responsibility to you. Therefore, the task was entrusted to them to ensure the evacuation of those areas. As God has consecrated that area for his own purpose, it was God's decree that the region of Palestine, where they had previously dwelled, 
and from where they had migrated during the time of Prophet Joseph would be their designated settlement following the appointment of Moses. It was a test for them to see if they could vacate the area. As a result of God's decision, Palestine became the Holy Land, a land specifically marked for God. God had chosen it, and as the Quran has stated, it said, now enter it, God will help you. It is Al-Arz Al-Muqaddisa, meaning the decision for its sanctification has been made. It will remain special for the religion and for the call of God. God has ordained it for you, Katab Allahu Lakum, meaning it is destined for you. You just have to enter it. In a similar manner, for the companions of the Prophet Muhammad, it was destined that their kingdom would be established in a large part of the world. However, they would have to strive for it, set out for it. When they set out, God would decide the results in their favor. So, the same decision has been made regarding them. Nonetheless, they exhibited vulnerability and were reluctant to undertake the mission. Prophet Moses passed away, and following his departure, under the leadership of his successors, they entered the region. Over time, their journey was marked by various challenges and moments of weakness. It was during the era of Samuel that they had the opportunity to settle there. Subsequently, David emerged and his vast empire was established. While it initially began with Saul, they had previously operated within a tribal framework. Subsequently, the reigns of David and Solomon followed. Throughout these stages, the significance of the Qibla evolved. In the initial phase, the Quran in Surah Jonah mentions that the houses of Prophet Moses and Aaron were designated as the Qibla while they were in Egypt. Since prayer is a fundamental aspect of religion, a specific direction is designated as the Qibla to facilitate congregational prayer. This choice creates a central point and provides a direction for prayer. What does it mean to designate something as the Qibla? Designating a Qibla serves the purpose of organizing congregational prayers with discipline. In a congregation, there needs to be a leader and the people must stand behind the leader, all facing in the same direction. The question then arises, which direction should they face? When they were in Egypt, as I mentioned, it is described in Surah Jonah. Some may question why the house of God in Mecca, which Prophet Abraham had inhabited and reconstructed, was not declared as the Qibla for them in Egypt. The answer lies in the fact that sometimes, when proper training has not occurred, or certain matters have become entrenched in national prejudices, or situations arise that serve their purposes, the status quo is not disrupted. The Prophet himself set an example in this regard. In his final days, upon seeing the area in front of the house of God, known as Hatim, he affirmed that it was a part of the house of God. Ideally, this entire area should have been utilized for the construction of the house of God structure. In the past, the situation was as follows, as conveyed by the prophet. This is how things used to be. However, the structure of the house of God had deteriorated and the Quraysh reconstructed it. Due to material and financial constraints, they left the construction incomplete. Being custodians, they desired a special status and therefore created a single elevated door for the house of God to control access. Only those they permitted could enter. This practice continues to this day where not everyone can enter freely. These two aspects were highlighted by the Prophet, prompting the question of rectifying the situation. In response, the Prophet addressed the issue, particularly in a conversation with our mother Aisha, stating, the people of your community have newly embraced Islam and there is a risk that this may lead to a significant controversy. Even if the Prophet himself does it? Yes, even if the Prophet himself does it. So it becomes crucial to take such matters into consideration. The designation of the Qibla is not a major issue. God has made it clear that it is meant to facilitate the organization of congregational prayer and is not a significant concern. Even homes were declared as Qibla at times. During one of his journeys, there was a chest containing tablets of the Torah 
or some holy relics of Moses that were declared as the Qibla. There is also mention of the tabernacle, often referred to as the tent of congregation, and how it should be constructed with detailed arrangements, which can be found in the Bible. The next stage was to build a place of worship for God, which is known as the Temple of Solomon. This was an outstanding and majestic structure. It's worth noting that even the jinns worked in the court of Prophet Solomon, and they were involved in building his palace, which the Quran describes as, this palace is made of crystal. Similarly, the temple structure was constructed with grandeur, although the term temple was used to denote its majesty. In reality, it was a masjid, place of worship, that was built. For this reason, the Quran has referred to it as the farthest mosque, Al-Masjid Al-Aqsa. Consequently, a grand mosque was constructed, which stood as a significant symbol for an extended period. During their era of power and dominance, particularly in the reign of Prophet Solomon, this mosque served as their central focal point. It is worth noting that circumstantial evidence, including references in the Bible, suggests that Prophet Solomon was involved in its construction. Some researchers even propose that both Prophet David and Prophet Solomon may have undertaken Hajj to Mecca, and there are hints that its Qibla direction of prayer was initially set towards the house of God in Mecca. However, with meticulous care, the construction of this mosque made it a symbol of their glory and held a central religious significance. This grandeur persisted for a considerable period. Subsequently, Nebuchadnezzar's invasion led to their decline, loss of status, and inability to meet the expectations placed upon them. There were specific expectations in terms of their faithfulness as the chosen nation, the fulfillment of their entrusted responsibilities as witnesses unto God and their internal unity. Regrettably, they fell short in meeting these essential requirements leading to divine punishment. This principle is also outlined in the Torah, stating that the chosen nation would face worldly consequences for significant transgressions. As observed in the Quran, such consequences befell them when they violated God's law regarding fishing on the Sabbath, resulting in a distortion of their nature. This served as their initial punishment. As detailed in the Quran in Surah Children of Israel, the punishment included the complete destruction of the temple, which is this mosque. When God administers punishment, it is done in a manner that underscores the severity of the transgressions. Who had attacked? The empire of Babylon. Nebuchadnezzar attacked, who is called Nebuchadnezzar. Both the pronunciations are correct. So this individual, or the king, launched an attack. This region had fallen under their authority, and there were frequent rebellions among them, as was common in ancient times when kings would descend to quell uprisings. They were subjugated, enslaved, and taken away as punishment. You can find this tale in the Bible, particularly during the time of Prophet Daniel, depicting their miserable existence. They were even prohibited from openly practicing their religion. They weren't even permitted to pray openly. This is a story in its own right, with many intricate details that we can't explore here. People can investigate the details themselves. This was their first punishment. Subsequently, God created better circumstances for them, and prophets were appointed among them to guide them back to the right path. Later on, during the reign of Cyrus, they got an opportunity to return, and their Torah, which had been scattered, was recompiled. This marked a period around 550 years before the birth of Prophet Jesus. Their life restarted, and the temple was reconstructed for the second time the situation continued until the time of Prophet Jesus. During that period, their moral decline had reached its zenith. Prophet John the Baptist, Yahya, was executed and his severed head was presented to a dancer. As mentioned in the Quran, they came very close to killing Jesus. Upon completion of Jesus' conclusive argumentation, God took him away from among them. A divine decree was made 
that another punishment would befall them, and the Romans attacked, devastating all places of worship, including the temple. Many were killed, captured, and subjected to atrocities, and scattered everywhere. This was the second divine punishment sent upon them. After Jesus, God decreed that this was their last chance. Those who claimed to be followers of Jesus would have supremacy over the Jews, the children of Israel, until the day of judgment. Two declarations were made. One, since they were the chosen race of the God, as opposed to the divine punishment of regular criminal nations, where the current generation of the nation get tormented, and that is the end of it. That divine punishment was inflicted upon them in 70 CE. But in addition to that, since the whole nation is the chosen race by the God, this decree was made and shall grant your followers supremacy over these disbelievers until the day of judgment. These declarations are documented in the Quran outlining the destiny of the chosen race of God. They would endure punishment, and those with even the slightest affiliation with Jesus, as mentioned in the Quran using the word ittabiuka, would hold dominion over the children of Israel until the day of judgment. The second declaration, as evident in Surah Al-Araf, suggests that intermittently individuals of this nature will emerge, signifying periods of respite lasting 50 or 100 years. However, such individuals will persistently arise to inflict severe torment, and this cycle will persist until the day of judgment. This has been their predicament, and the only way for them to escape it is by repenting for their mistakes, turning back to God, and acknowledging Prophet Jesus. That's it. This led to God's decision to choose the other branch of Abraham's descendants, known as Bani Ishmael. Among them, the decision was made to appoint Muhammad as a messenger of God, and the process of providing irrefutable evidence, known as Itmam e Hujar, was completed. As a result, the earthly court of God was established for them, and God declared that from that moment forward, Bani Ishmael were granted the same position. What is that position? It is the role of bearing witness to God's existence and testifying on his behalf. In similar words, it was announced, Huwaj tabakum, meaning, he has selected you. Millata abikum Ibrahim, he has chosen the community of your father, Abraham, for you. You are now entrusted with upholding the same faith that Abraham, your forefather, followed. He is indeed your patriarch. And likewise, وَكَذَلِكَ جَعَلْنَكُمْ أُمَّةً وَسَطًا لِتَكُونُوا شُهَدَاءَ عَلَى النَّاسِ وَيَكُونَ الرَّسُولُ عَلَيْكُمْ شَهِدًا It means, we have also made you an intermediate community so that you may bear witness to the truth before all the people of the world and the messenger of God may bear this witness before you. In essence, you are one of the nations among the many nations of the world. At one end stands your God's messenger, while ahead of you lie the diverse nations of the world. The messenger will serve as God's witness to you, and you will be witnesses to mankind, the various nations of the world. The real debate isn't about the fairness of these decisions, or whether bringing Jews was just or unjust, nor is it about the injustice of establishing a nation for one people in the land of the Palestinians. These discussions are secondary. The crux is that we are under a system devised by the victors, until the vanquished change the conditions based on which they have tasted defeat, no amount of resistance will be able to change it. In the context of the word masjid used here, some individuals who tend to interpret things literally may argue that there was no physical building there. The term masjid does not necessarily refer to a physical structure, but implies a place for prostration. In other words, that compound or area holds special significance because it was chosen by a prophet, and the selection of prophets is in accordance with the will of God. Therefore, until the day of judgment, it remains a masjid, a piece of land designated for worship. With this understanding, 
The Quran refers to it as Al-Masjid Ul-Aqsa. It is a sprawling compound covering acres of land, which you may see for yourself at some point. What does Aqsa mean? Distant. All right. Clearly concerning Makkah, it was a distant masjid. That masjid far away was known to people, that is to say that place of worship, that location for prostration, even when you choose an elevated courtyard in a marketplace, it is still considered a masjid. There, you don't require a pulpit or the construction of arches, pillars, a dome, or a minaret. If a building is erected, that's excellent. Otherwise, it's not a problem. You are aware that the House of God structure was demolished for reconstruction during the time of Abdullah bin Zubair. Even when the Quraysh raised it, it still retained its status as the House of God. In such cases, its name remains unchanged. This is the point to consider when it's mentioned that the Prophet was taken there by God and some of his signs were shown to him. As I have mentioned in the interpretation of Surah Children of Israel, you can regard this incident of Isra as an illustration or symbolizing the fact that the responsibility entrusted to them in Palestine has now, with this new appointment, that trust, and this new trust have merged into the personality of the revered and great messenger, Prophet Muhammad. It is now the responsibility of Bani Ishmael to take care of this matter until the day of judgment. This is the special status of the Arabian Peninsula, and this is the history of the special status of Palestine. The Palestine was referred to as the sacred land, Al-Arzul Muqaddisa, and this area is also considered the same. For that area, there was a divine decree that as long as the Israelites resided in that region, it was their duty to safeguard it against the proliferation of polytheism or disbelief. And the same responsibility now rests with Bani Ishmael regarding this region. I explained to you the nature of God's selection and why, with reference to the children of Israel and Palestine as a city or country, it holds such significance in religion. It was the first choice of God as a center for his Tawheed, monotheism, for this entire region. Just as he chose the Arabian Peninsula and after the appointment of Muhammad as the Prophet of God, revived its status. Muslims are bound to maintain this status until the Day of Judgment. La yajtameu fihi dinan. Never would two religions assemble together here ever again. Certainly, your detailed explanation is greatly appreciated. Among the points discussed so far, I would like to delve into a few related aspects to provide further clarity. First and foremost, please clarify that when the previous nation was removed from their responsibility and the same position was entrusted to Bani Ishmael and the Messenger, it pertained to the sanctification of a specific piece of land and the designation of a particular region. In such a scenario, when one nation is replaced in this position, one would logically expect that the previous issues should have automatically come to an end. You mentioned that both of these regions were considered sacred. Given this, even after the responsibility was transferred, did the sanctity of the earlier land still persist? No, the matter had come to a close. God's punishment had befallen them. It has been mentioned that your status has now changed, as stated in the verse, وَجَعِلِ الَّذِينَ اتَّبَعُوكَ فَوْقَ الَّذِينَ كَفَرُوا إِلَى يَوْمِ الْقِيَامَةِ I shall grant your followers supremacy over these disbelievers until the day of judgment. Now, God will only look upon them with favor when, since this choice was made by God, the matter is that God has granted us the land of Arabia. However, may God forbid, heaven forfend, this is a distressing thought, if the Muslim Ummah were to also deviate in such ways, and God takes it away from them, I repeat, may it never happen, let it never be so. But if God were to take it away, what would it signify? It would signify that the people have fallen under His punishment. So despite continuous warnings from God, the final decree against them was made after the appointment of Prophet Jesus. Even earlier, warnings had been issued and the scourge of punishment had descended. The complete history of this is narrated in Surah Children of Israel in the Quran. However, for the last time, it was decreed that until Judgment Day, they would be under divine punishment. Unless they return and adopt the right path, naturally, it is a significant condition. They must accept Prophet Jesus 
and declare faith in Muhammad as the prophet of God. If they do not adhere to these conditions, the matter is entirely closed. God has sealed it. So when God states, Wa in uttum udna, but remember that if you do the same, we too shall do the same, and afu bi ahdi, ufi bi ahdi. Keep my covenant, I shall keep yours. So what does this imply? Does it refer to the children of Israel or the nation of Palestine or the people present today, the Jews? Will they repent and accept the responsibility? If so, how will God respond given that he has already removed them and a new nation has taken over? What is meant by reverting? Reverting means accepting Jesus, peace be upon him, and Muhammad, peace be upon him, the prophets of God. The entire issue is resolved. But what is implied by returning? Returning means becoming part of the Ummah. After the appointment of Muhammad, peace be upon him, the responsibility of conveying the message was given to the Bani Ishmael. They are responsible for the invitation, and if one accepts their call, they become a part of the Muslim nation. If that happens, it would be great. Obviously, it's not possible to say that we won't accept the decrees of God, which include the appointments of Jesus, peace be upon him, and Muhammad, peace be upon him, and claim we repent. So, where have you reverted to? It refers to the whole issue that began when God sent Jesus, peace be upon him. The process of presenting irrefutable evidence was completed through him. Instead of accepting his call and following him, they sought his life and attempted to crucify him, reaching the height of rebellion. So, redressal is necessary. The door is always open to them, and God will be kind and merciful to them when they accept it. This is the decree of God as described, and in this context, Palestine achieved its religious status. Similarly, the Arabian Peninsula achieved its status in this backdrop as well. Could you please explain why, after the appointment of the descendants of Ishmael, there was a change in the Qibla direction mentioned in the Quran? For the Israelites, you told us the story of their transitions of the Qibla from initially facing the houses, then the chest, followed by the construction of the temple, the sacred mosque. Why were the Ishmaelites instructed to face that mosque in Jerusalem while praying? This matter has been addressed in the Quran. If you acquire knowledge of God's religion, not through hearsay, but from the Book of God, you will discover that it contains two types of commands. One type comprises the eternal commands of the Sharia, while the other type relates to directives associated with trials where God tests his people. So let's delve into the situation of the Ishmaelites. Their primary attachment was to the house of God in Mecca. God has emphasized that the Qibla, the direction of prayer, is nothing to be fixated about. It is simply the designation of a masjid, a building, or a place as a reference point. The crucial element is obedience to the command of God and His Messenger, which has been established. As I mentioned earlier, in chapter Jonah of the Quran, when Prophet Musa was appointed, their houses were designated as the Qibla. So what has been done here is to convey to the Ishmaelites that the pivotal matter is to follow the command of God. For them, Baitul Maqdis, the Temple of Solomon, or as we call it, the Aqsa Mosque, was designated as their Qibla. When we refer to the Aqsa Mosque, we are not referring solely to a building, but to a compound where that structure was erected. This compound, covering acres of land, will remain a place for prostration until the Day of Judgment. Therefore, this was designated as their Qibla. The Quran clarifies that this was a test given to the Ishmaelites to see whether they would follow the commands of the Messenger of God or get entangled in debates about the history of the Qibla. It was a test to assess their response. Thus, it was a temporary test imposed upon them for a few years only. Upon the migration of Muslims to Medina, their primary responsibility was to extend the invitation to the people of the scripture, which included the Jews and Christians of Medina. Consequently, they too became subjects of the test. God conducts fair tests of people. The test for the descendants of Ishmael was whether, upon the command of the prophet, would they face toward Jerusalem or not. Similarly, the people of the scripture were tested to determine whether they would face Mecca, despite the alterations in their religion, 
upon the command of God and the prophet, both groups underwent these tests. The two groups that were the primary audience of the messenger, the Arab polytheists in the Arabian Peninsula, Ishmaelites, and the people of the scripture. The Ishmaelites were tested first, and it was explicitly stated that the purpose was الرسول, to ascertain who among them would follow the messenger and who would revert to their previous practices upon learning about the change in the Qibla. So this was a clear command given for the purpose of testing, and there is no doubt about it. The Quran explicitly mentions this. The final question for today's session, when the children of Israel were removed from their position and the children of Ishmael were appointed, did God provide the Ishmaelites with specific instructions regarding the previously designated sacred land? Were they informed that the region, which had been chosen for the last nation, where messengers of God had been sent for a long time, and that nation had failed in their responsibilities, was now their responsibility? Additionally, since the land of the previously chosen people was also sacred to God and a place of worship had been constructed there, were they given guidance on how to safeguard it and ensure its continued habitation by them? No, absolutely no instructions were given. It has been explicitly stated that it is the Arabian Peninsula where two religions would not converge. So the completion of arguments was done on the Arabian Peninsula. There, the Muslims or the Ishmaelites established their power. Along with it, in the last four years prior to his departure from the world, the Prophet extended his invitation to the surrounding regions. So all those regions which were in the vicinity were all conquered. The companions too, as a result of the completion of proof, gave them the punishment. Those punishments were also applied to them. And the decree of the Quran, until they pay the jizya from their hands and live a life of submission. This became applicable to the whole area. That whole region included Palestine also. This is the general statement that is made. Otherwise, there isn't any specific command. Actually, that became a tale of the past. From the point of view of religion, it was all over. Certainly, we initiated our discussion on Palestine, covering its religious, historical, and political aspects. Insha'Allah, we will continue this discussion. We will delve into the actions of the Sahaba when Caliph Umar arrived in Jerusalem, the conquest of the city, and the subsequent events. Furthermore, I aim to bring the conversation to a point where people can better understand the current status of this issue in the contemporary period. Our time for today has come to an end. Thank you.